welcome to our service online. We're just about to show you some clips of some baptisms that we had last week. Uh, pastor Gary Smith, uh, on his last Sunday as our lead pastor, had the privilege of baptizing uh, two families, uh, three members in one and two members in another. Uh, so let's watch as, as they uh, give us their testimonies and as Pastor Gary performs the baptism. We have uh, a family that we're getting to baptize here together, uh, and it's neat. It's three generations of folks. So it's Kelly Wiseman, and then her son Daniel, and then um, Kelly's mom, Evelyn. And so they're going to share their testimonies, each one, before their baptism. And so we'll invite Kelly uh, to come up first. So thank you, Kelly. Hi, Bow Valley family. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Kelly. My parents raised me and my brother to love God, and we went to Sunday school. So I always considered myself to be a Christian. I told myself it's okay that I don't attend church each Sunday because I believed in the Lord, and I'm a good person. About a year ago, I knew something was missing in my life, and I made the decision to come to Bow Valley Baptist Church. <clears throat> It was around this time that I really began to know Jesus. This is where I start to get emotional. I came to fully understand that he loves me so much that he would die for my sins so that through the grace of God, I am forgiven. I have never felt such peace and joy in my life. I was finally able to let go of all the anger and the resentment that I had a hold of me, and forgive as I am forgiven. God loves me and the world so much, as it is written in John 3.16, my favorite, that he gave his son that those who believe in him will have eternal life. I feel encouraged to know that by accepting Jesus as my Savior and loving with an open heart as he loves me, that one day I get to live with him. I want to be baptized today to follow the Lord's example. In Matthew 28, 18 through 20, Jesus tells his followers to be baptized like him and to obey him, and he will be with us forever. And that, to me, is so comforting. So Kelly, thank you for your testimony. I know that you have prayed and asked the Lord Jesus to be your leader of your life, forgiver of your sins. I know you've done that, right? Fantastic. Well, Kelly, just as you quoted there from Matthew 28, it's now my pleasure to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. This is Kelly's son, Daniel. And would you like to read that, Daniel, or would you like me to? Uh, Hello, I'm Daniel, and I am 12. I started attending Bow Valley Baptist Church just over a year now. It was around that time when I came to know Jesus Christ personally, and I know that he died on the cross for me to pay for my sins. It is because of this that I have asked him to become my Savior. John 3.16 tells me that God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus Christ, that whoever believes in him shall be saved. It is because of this that I know I will have eternal life. In Mark chapter 1, 9 to 11, Jesus was baptized in the Jordan by John and set an example for the world. In Matthew 28, 18 to 20, Jesus tells us to be baptized and to obey him, and he will be with us always. I want to be baptized to follow Jesus' example and begin my new life with Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Well done, Daniel. That is so good. Well, I had the privilege of being with Daniel when he prayed that prayer. And um, it was a precious time with Kelly and I both, his mom. And I see such a sincere faith in his life. And so it's an awesome, awesome thing to get to baptize you. So Daniel, have you asked the Lord Jesus Christ to, to come into your life, to be your Lord and your Savior? Fantastic. Upon your profession of faith, Daniel, it's now my pleasure to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, this is Evelyn, Kelly's mom. She's invited me to read her testimony, so that's beautiful. I wish I could say this with your beautiful accent. 
I grew up in Newfoundland in a church family. I have been going to church for many years. I would feel great on Sunday, but I had so much depression and anxiety during the rest of the week that I never had much peace in my life. I would pray each night to thank God for my blessings and ask for forgiveness of my sins, but I never felt peace. On January 20th, 2020, my life changed completely. When I found my husband on the floor in the porch of our house and I screamed out to God, I thought everything was over for me. I was sick with worry and fear, thinking, how do I go on? How do I deal with this? I felt like I was left all alone in this world. I felt so empty. I leaned on my husband so much. The only thing that brought me comfort was knowing that he was with the Lord. It wasn't long after that I got on my knees and I cried out to God for help. I prayed to the Lord to bring me peace. That is when I felt I wasn't alone. I finally felt the peace I was praying for. I wasn't worried about anything. God put it all into place for me. I now know that God will not give me more than I can handle, and he will never leave me. For the past seven months, I have had no anxiety. God gives me the strength to get through each day. Even though I miss my husband, I know I will see him again. I want to be baptized because Jesus commanded us to do this, as he did in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, according to Matthew 28, 18 to 20. Jesus was baptized by John in the Jordan, as written in Mark 1, 9 to 11. And when he came up from the water, he saw the heavens part and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. I believe that baptism symbolizes coming out of the water into a new life and relationship with my Heavenly Father. Evelyn, have you asked the Lord Jesus Christ to be your Savior, to be the Lord of your life, and the forgiver of your sins? Yes, I have. Amen. 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 Well, Evelyn, it is now my pleasure to baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Great to see you, man. Are you going to read your testimony or would you like me to? Okay, no problem. <laughs> Hello, church friends and family. My name is Atlas. I've been attending Bow Valley Church for two years. I first came to know Jesus Christ when I was 10. I decided to get baptized because I want to further my relationship with God and Jesus. I believe baptism is the next step after accepting Jesus into your heart. Jesus sacrificed everything for us and loved us like his brothers and sisters. Through baptism, I know that we will be able to live eternal life with God. Wow. And I know you know that your relationship with Christ that gives you eternal life, right? Atlas, isn't that awesome? Well, it's been my pleasure to walk with Atlas and his family. They've been in our small group, and we just love these guys tremendously as well. And so, Atlas, we're really proud of you as well today. And we're excited for your decision to follow Jesus and to be baptized. So, Atlas... Have you asked the Lord Jesus to be the Lord, the leader of your life, and to save you, to be the Savior? Uh, and you understand that he died for your sins and he rose again, like we talked about in the Scripture? Yes. Absolutely. That was a big question I asked you, wasn't it? And that was a great answer. Well, Atlas, upon your profession of faith, it's now my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Ready? All right. Would you like me to read or you want to? Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> no problem at all. So she asked me to read this. Here, I'm not getting through it. Okay, so we're going to be okay. You know, there's nothing much more precious than this. Eh? When I was a teenager, my mother had had a mental breakdown and was hospitalized. It was at this time I started to question everything. I became a non believer. Having gone through most of my life with an alcoholic father that only came around when it was convenient for him, and then to have your mother lose her ability to nurture her three teenage girls fully, fully on her own due to her needing to focus on her health, we, my sisters and I, had to grow up fast. We helped each other through these years. I only attended church when I was visiting my grandmother, but didn't pay attention. <laughs> I wasn't ready to because I was bitter with life. When I had my first son, it became clear to me that life was not what I had thought. Going to church had meaning again, and I listened, but still had doubts. It became a back-and-forth head game. It wasn't until a year ago, after coming to Bow Valley Baptist and meeting Sue and Gary and being a part of group discussions, that I took a step with my faith and prayed. I had always spoken to my grandmother after her passing, but never prayed, at least not since my mother ended up in the hospital all these years ago. 
When I took this step, there was a lot of tears. I was still confused about life, but knew then that I have God with me. He is with me and gave us all an amazing gift when he sacrificed his son. I want God to know I believe Jesus rose from the dead to show us that our sins too can be washed and we can live with him eternally. Macy, I know that you have asked Jesus Christ to forgive you your sins and to come into your life to be the Lord and leader of your life. Is that right? Fantastic. Well, Tracy, upon your profession of your faith, it's now my pleasure to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. I was just going to say about that. Um, I, I know I just gave a hug there. We've been good friends for a couple years now, her and our, their family. They actually signed waivers so I could be all close to them and baptize them and do all that kind of stuff. So anyway, and I don't say that lightly. It's very important, actually. But I just wanted you to know that church family because uh, we have invited people not to shake hands and all that. And then you see the pastor going. But anyway, we signed a waiver. If you want to give me a hug, I can give you a little waiver. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But we are asking everybody to hold back on that, even though we've done that all most of our life. Eh? We're praying a day that we'll, that we'll be free again, right, to be able to do that. But what a privilege. This week, some have experienced success and joy. Others have experienced challenge and heartache. Some have worked hard at their day jobs. Others are searching for a job to sustain them. Some have poured into their families. Others dream of having a family. Some are starting something new. Others are finishing something old. They may not be us or look like us, but their stories are our stories, and their lives are our lives. And they remind us that we've all come from different places and situations. But there is one thing that isn't different about us. There's one area of common ground that we can't run away from. All of us, every single person gathered here today, is in desperate need of God. Whether we admit it or not, we all need God desperately. In our highs, in our lows, in our confusion and in our clarity, in our loneliness and our doubt, in our joys and in our sorrows, we're all in desperate need of God. And that's our common ground. That's our universal need. And that's why church is so beautiful. Because when a gathering of people is found at the intersection of diversity and desperation, well, you never know what God might do. Hi, and welcome to the online service for Bow Valley Baptist Church, Sunday, September 6th. We're so glad you could join us. The staff has been working really hard to start several ministries in September, including youth, children, and small groups. So please be watching for emails from the church or social media to get details on those. Be watching also for details about the annual highway cleanup that will be happening on Saturday, September 19th. This week we had a really important vote on our September to December budget. I wanna thank our members who took time to vote and I'm thrilled to say that the vote came out to 100% in approval of that. So thank you so much. Lastly, I want to welcome Bob Shelton as our interim pastor. This week will be his first Sunday to preach. I know we're all looking forward to hearing from him and the message that God has put on his heart. Thanks so much. We're glad you're here. Our Lord Jesus taught us how to pray in Matthew chapter 6. He said, Pray then in this way. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Prayer is a conversation where we can express ourselves to God. We can praise Him for the blessings He has given us, and also we can pour out our hearts before His presence, recognizing that 
We need him every day, every moment of our lives. Jesus also said in, in Matthew, Matthew chapter 18, verse 19, Again, truly I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. And that's why we intercede and pray for each other. And also we pray together as a church. I would like to encourage you to stop the videos as you see each prayer request and bring those requests before our God. Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful because we can come into our presence, Lord. We can open our hearts and minds to you, Lord. We can bring our troubles. We can bring our praises to you, Lord. We can have an open conversation with you. Father, and you will help us every time you do, Lord. You will calm our hearts. You guide our minds, Lord, and help us to live our lives for you. Father, I want to ask you to bless our church and help us to continue to serve you, Lord, in this town, to bring glory to your name. I want to ask you to bless our staff as uh, we plan together, Lord, for for the uh, for your church, Lord, the, the, the things that we'll be doing for your church. And also, Father, I ask, ask you to bless the leadership team, that you continue to guide them in each step they they prepare to move forward. Father, I'm so thankful for Bob and Debbie for being for them to be able to be with us. I want to ask you as well to guide and bless and use them, Lord, to strengthen our church during this time, Lord, as we will be seeking for uh, a new senior pastor. Father, thank you, Lord. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for uh, giving your son Jesus, to die on the cross for us as an ultimate sacrifice to bring us back into a relationship with you. And in, in the name of Jesus that I pray. Amen. Welcome you here this morning, whether you're worshiping from home or you're here with us this morning. We're going to invite you to just worship with us, whether you can sing at home or just hum along here. So please join us as we sing.
Hi, I'm Leanne Lean, and I'm part of the children's ministry team here at Bow Valley. You know, I'm sitting here with uh, my water bottle today because uh, today my family and I went on a hike. And you know, near the end of that hike, or about half, more than halfway through, um, I was getting pretty thirsty. In fact, you could probably say I was getting pretty desperate uh, for a drink of cold water. And fortunately, there happened to be a fresh mountain stream not pretty near nearby that I was able to go and fill my water bottle. But, but at that point in the hike, I was feeling pretty desperate for a drink of water. Kids, I don't know if you have ever felt that way, but have you ever been desperate for anything? Maybe it's something like you were desperate to get outside, <laughs> just to be outside. Maybe you were feeling desperate to just be with people or be with friends lately. Or maybe you're desperate for, for news. You've been waiting and waiting and waiting to hear news from a friend or from someone and you're, you've been just desperate to hear. Those are things we can be desperate for. I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but have you ever thought about being desperate though for God? Hmm. Interesting thought. You know, today Pastor Bob is going to talk about being desperate for God and what that might look like. As you're listening today, kids, see if you can pick out and listen for the three things that Pastor Bob is going to mention. That what is it that we can be desperate for God for? What 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 things do we need from God? Because of course, when we're desperate, we we think we really need them or want them. Let's listen in and hear what he has to say, and see if you can pick out those things. Good morning, Bow Valley. What an honor it is to be with you this morning. Thank you for this opportunity to walk with you during these days ahead. I really love God's church, and I love this church, and believe God has an amazing future for us together. Actually, this is the third time I've served as your interim pastor. Uh, I know a bit of your history and look forward to what God is going to do in our midst in the days ahead. George Bojackley was your first pastor, and then Hamish Bunting, and after Hamish, I served as interim pastor then, and then Mel Blackaby, and then Pastor Dwight, and I served as interim after Pastor Dwight, and then Gary came, and now I'm serving as interim again. So we have a bit of a history together, so I'm looking forward to our time. We have, uh, I've been married to Debbie for 48 years, and uh, I have four kids and 10 grandchildren, and I planted a church in Winnipeg back in 1984, and I pastored that church for 15 years, and then in 1998, I came and served as the leadership and pastor to pastor for the Canadian National Baptist Convention, and uh, since 2013, I've been serving as a Sin City missionary for the North American Mission Board here in Calgary. What I do with that is my role is to help churches start churches where there are none. I've been a youth pastor, a worship pastor, an associate pastor, a lead pastor, a church planter, an interim pastor, a denominational worker. I've been involved in some type of ministry for 52 years. I'd like to share with you a few thoughts as we begin our journey together. I, When my kids were young, we used to have what we would call family talks, and so as we begin our journey together, I would like to just share with you some thoughts from my heart to, to let you know. Some of these things I included in a letter that you should have received this week. If you didn't, please let us know, and we want you to receive that letter. But I want us to all be on the same page. First of all, I want you to know that whenever God calls a new pastor, that none of God leaves. This is Christ's church, and we will miss Pastor Gary and Sue uh, as Pat being our pastor, but this will not hinder us from being the church that God wants us to be, this community of faith that he's called us to be. During times of transition, what I've noticed is that sometimes people lean in and some folks lean out. What do I mean by that? Well, I mean, if a person has been so connected to the church, to personalities in the church, either the pastor or other people in the church, they may drift away. If we look to Christ, we will seek to lean in and hear and seek to hear his voice and listen to what God is calling us to next. What I want you to do is I want to invite you to lean in, to lean into Christ and, and not lean out. Don't drift away, but lean into Christ. My role will be to work with your staff and leaders and pastor search team to give encouragement, to give leadership and support. 
I will, I will coordinate the preaching schedule. I'm going to work with Paulo, and I'm going to work with Alex Brown. We're going to develop a little bit of a preaching team, and we'll, we'll carry the bulk of the load in preaching. But I've got some other people interspersed. Pastor Dwight will be here speaking next week. And I believe people who will challenge and encourage you and inspire you to become all that God intends. Now, because I have a full-time job, I'm only going to speak once or twice a month. And so just sort of, so you'll know that up front. I do hope that you will treat those who speak on each Sunday as, uh, I hope you will treat uh, them not like an ice skating event or diving competition. You know, this, this person was really good. They're an eight or this person really stunk today. We'll give them a three. Come with an expectant and prepared spirit and, and just breathe this prayer. Spirit of God. Take the word of God and do the work of God in our hearts and lives today. That's what I pray that you'll do every Sunday. Let God's word fall on good soil where it will bear good fruit and reap a harvest of right living in you and in in all of us. My primary task, though, is this, to prepare you, to prepare you to receive God's next leader. And the primary question isn't, Who is our next pastor going to be? But who are we? And how are we preparing our hearts to be the people God desires for us to be? Remember that psalm, search me, O God, and know my heart. And so we're going to be doing that together. Uh, Can I say this to you? Every leader is a blend of strengths and weaknesses. I know I am. You're going to find that out me very, very soon. I, that's very true of me. I think when I die, I have a group of young men who know me well, and I think they're going to write a book of true, stupid stuff that I have done and said. But every leader is a blend of strengths and weaknesses. That was true of Pastor Gary. That's true of all the pastors who came before him. And it's true of your leadership team. And it will be true of your next pastor. Every leader. You are a blend of strengths and weaknesses. There is no perfect pastor and there is no perfect church. So let's give grace to each other and let's believe the best and bring out the best in each other. Can we do that together? I want to say just a few words about our COVID response. Um, I've never pastored in the midst of a global pandemic before and I've never pastored during a COVID response before. But but before I jump into my message, I, I want to share with you a little bit. I talked with a leadership team about this the other night, and I want to talk with you before we begin. And first of all, uh, let me just tell you a little story that happened to me a couple weeks ago. I was in Starbucks, and I walk into Starbucks, and this sweet young lady starts walking up to me, and she's got this beautiful smile on her face, and she has a cookie bag in her hand. And I think, oh, this is amazing. I'm going to get a cookie. And you know what was in the cookie bag? A mask. A mask. She said, would you like one of these, sir? And I said, well, get, yes, I guess I will. And so I put the mask on, and I needed to put the mask on before I placed my order. And so I, I, what I want you to do is I think there's two extremes that people have. They're, they're just really sort of one way or another, and they, they have a hard time finding that middle. I, I want all of our responses to be Christ-like. I, I want us ask, I want us to ask this question. What does love ask of us? What would be a Christ-like response? What does love require? Not demanding my rights and oh, I have the right to this, but what is a Christ-like response in the midst of all this COVID? So we worked together with the pastor search team and we sort of said, all right, what do we value? Values are only those things that are really important to us. And so what's really important to us? And as a team, we said, we value connection. Your staff said this. Your leadership team said this. We value connection, whether it's in small groups or through social media or weekly gatherings, whatever it is, we want people to find ways to stay connected in the midst of all that's going on. We don't want anyone to fall through the cracks. We want people to to stay connected. And then we value personal and corporate worship. We desire for people to to worship not only in privately, but together. And we want to find ways to bring people together in a safe environment where people have a sense of safety, but also where they have a sense of the glory of God and the presence of God in their midst. We value freedom in Christ. 
So however a person or family chooses to, to respond to COVID, we do not want it to become a test of fellowship or faith. Like if someone chooses not to come because they, their immune system is compromised or because of their family situation, we're not going to pass any judgment on them. We're just going to give freedom in Christ for them to do what they sense is best at this season for their family. We value mutual respect. We must not allow the enemy to cause division. In, at our church at Bow Valley or to steal our joy. We'll respect each other and, and we'll allow for differing opinions. And then lastly, we value new opportunities to see how God's going to lead us to join him in his mission to reach Cochrane, not just on Sunday, but every day of the week. And so with all that as a preface, I want to launch in to a message that I've prepared for you this morning. And In a couple of weeks, I'm going to speak to you from John 14, where Jesus just invites us to ask. But sometimes during transitions, we try to do things in our own strength. Things get tough, and we just sort of pull up our bootstraps, and we say, I'm going to do the best I can. I want to run as hard as I can. And and so what I want us to do is, as a church, I want us to begin for the first 40 days. I want, us, I want us to spend the 40 days acknowledging our dependence upon God. And In fact, I've entitled our messages this whole month, Desperate for God. And uh, so that's where I want us to begin this morning. You remember the story, don't you? Moses was up on the mountain getting the Ten Commandments from God, and the people got restless. This is in, in chapter 32 of Exodus. And the people got restless and, uh, and they said, you know, Aaron, build us a golden calf. And so for some reason, Aaron built them a golden calf and they began to bow down to it. And they said, this is the gods that delivered us out of Egypt. And, and, and God told Moses to go back down because the people were, were behaving very poorly. They've so quickly forgot God. And Moses comes down and, and he throws the tablets and they break apart. Perhaps a picture of them of breaking the very first commandment that they, they should not worship any other gods but the Lord God. That first commandment says, you shall have no other gods before me, beside me, or after me. It's not God first and something else second. You shall have no other gods, period. So in Exodus chapter 3, it opens with God says, I'm going to send you on your way to the promised land. I'm going to keep my word. I'm going to keep my promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I promised them a land. But he says, I will, you go, and I'm going to send an angel with you, but I'm not going to go because you are a stiff-necked and stubborn people, and if I go, I might slay you. And Moses sort of cries out to God. This is this crisis point where He's saying, do they want the blessings of God or do they want God? And so Moses says, he says, he said, them, if your presence will not go with me, do not bring me up from here. For how shall we know that I have found favor in your sight and your people? It, if it is not, you're going with us so that we are distinct in I and your people from every other people on the face of the earth. Do you sense the desperation? Do you sense Moses crying out to God? God, if you don't go with us, I don't want to go. We cannot do this on our own. And so Moses gives us a prayer that we can use in all kinds of desperate times in our lives. Moses gives us three requests that we can pray, not only to get to the heart of what we need, but at the heart of what God wants for us. The first thing that Moses requests is friendship with God. Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You've said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now, therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me your ways that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. So Moses realized that God has appointed him to be the leader over Israel, over this people, this stubborn and stiff-necked people. And then he realizes that he can't do it on his own. He says, you have not let me know whom you're going to send with me. Who's going to help Moses? Is it going to be an angel? 
That would be pretty cool, but that's not what Moses wants. In fact, God has already promised to send an angel to go, but he will not go himself. But that's not good enough. Moses says that he wants something in particular from God. Just as God knows Moses and God calls Moses his friend, Moses wants to know God. Moses wants to know God. We were made to know God and to, ma- and to be known by him. I don't think Moses is talking about some theoretical knowing. He's talking about knowing God in a personal and intimate relationship. J.I. Packard says, a little knowledge of God is worth more than a great deal of knowledge about God. And so this whole idea of not just knowing about God, but really knowing him in a personal and intimate way. Again, we were made to know God and to be known by him. What we're hungry for, Moses prays for, is for God to choose to open up to us and to establish a friendship with us. Remember that psalm in Psalm 42? He said, as the deer pants for the water brook, so my soul thirsts. My soul is thirsty for you, God. There's this cry from the psalmist that he says, God, I want to know you. I want to know you more. That, let that be our prayer as a church, that we would know God in such an intimate way that we would have friendship. We could say we are friends of God. Perhaps you have been acquainted uh, with the Bible and acquainted with Christian truth for many years, and, and it's meant little to you. But one day you wake up to this fact that God is actually speaking to you, to you, through his biblical message. And you come to realize as you listen that God is actually opening up his heart to you. Now, that's a pretty good prayer for us to pray, isn't it? Especially when we start to lose hope in this world. Pray, Lord, I want to know you. In fact, why don't you say that right now? Lord, I want to know you. It's a prayer that he is eager to answer. In the end thing, in the end thing it's the only thing that really matters. Jeremiah, he says these words. He says, thus says the Lord, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom and let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches but let him who boasts, boast in this, that he understand and knows me, that I am the Lord, Yahweh. I am Yahweh who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. When things are really bad, pray to know God. And then there's a second request that Moses gives. And it's this, he says, Moses says to God, if your presence does, will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. Because he says, he says, for how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Now, this is pretty interesting because God has already told Moses that he will give Israel what they want. In the beginning of the chapter, he says, I will send an angel before you and I will drive out the Canaanites and the Amorites. He says, go up to the land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go up among you lest I consume you by the way for you are a stiff-necked people. He says, they can have everything they want, the promised land at all, the land flowing with milk and honey. God says, except for his presence with them. Now that's pretty interesting, isn't it? It's going to be telling to them and to God Do they just want God's blessings or do they want God? Do they just want the benefits or do they want God? I I was thinking about this message and I started to say desperate for God's guidance, but then I started, no, God, we don't just want your guidance or your provision or your protection. God, we're desperate for you. We're desperate for you to be in our midst. I wonder what would happen if God so does that we could have everything that we wanted Minus his presence. If all our, all our dreams could come true, but without him. You see, Moses doesn't want to go anywhere that God's not going. Moses does not want to go anywhere where God is not going and where God is not leading. Moses shows us what we really need isn't 
isn't that all of our problems will be, be solved or even all of our dreams will come true, although that might be really nice. What we really need most of all is God's presence with us. It would be better, Moses says, to live in a desert with no home permanently than to go to the promised land without God. The reason, the very thing that set Israel apart from every other, everyone else wasn't their land, their wealth, their culture, or anything else, because they had none of these. The only thing that set them apart was God's presence with them. The same applies to us. We need to know God. We also need his presence to see the progression here. We see the progression. First, Moses wants to know God. And then second, Moses wants God to move in with them. Moses doesn't just want to know God or about God. He wants God to live with them. But there's more. There's a third request that he makes, and that's this. Most people would stop with friendship and presence, but that would be enough. But for Moses, it wasn't enough. He said, God, please show me your glory. What an audacious request. God's glory is almost impossible for us to describe as human beings. One person defines it as the infinite beauty and greatness of God's manifold perfection. John Piper says that. Moses had already seen glimpses of God's glory at the burning bush and and when he had entered God's presence on the mountaintop. Now he wants to see the fullness of God's beauty and his greatness. And that's what he he goes together, and he brings that together. We were made for God's glory. You know, whenever things get tough and whenever things are bad, God wants us to go, and he wants us to experience not only his friendship and his presence, but his glory. And so that's what I desire for you. And in Jesus Christ, we have all of these. We have God's presence with us. He came, he died so that we could be friends with God. He came to break down the barrier and the wall. He came to his presence. He said, he said in in John 14, here's what he said, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory as of the only son from the Father, full of grace and truth. We have seen his friendship, his presence, and his glory in Jesus Christ. Do you remember that old song, the old song, the old hymn that said, He leadeth me, O blessed thought. That's what I want for you and for me and this whole church family in these days. I want us to, I want us to, I want us to pray for things to change. I want things to get better from COVID. But most of all, regardless, the prayer that we're going to pray in this desperate time is, God, we are desperate for your presence for your prince friendship and for your glory let's pray together god thank you thank you for these friends that are listening online for those folks who will join us here in worship god i pray that uh, we would cry out to you that we would say as a church family god We are desperate for you, and we don't want to go anywhere that you're not leading. So please, God, help us not just to know about you, but help us to know you and to intimate, personal relationship. Thank you that we can do that through Jesus. Thank you that he has made a way. He has has paid the penalty for our sins so that we can have life and friendship with God. Thank you for your presence that you came and dwelt among us and that your presence goes before us. See, you said to your disciples, and lo, I will be with you always. We have that promise. And then Jesus, you said, John writes, and he says, we have beheld his glory. And so, Jesus, we want to see your glory in this place. We want to see your glory in the lives of these people. We don't want to just talk about you. We want to live for you. We want to learn to live our lives on mission for Jesus. So thank you. Thank you for this moment together. May you bless this congregation in the days ahead. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. me
Have you ever heard the song, I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God? If you've been with the church for a few years, in your head you're probably hearing it sung in DK's deep, booming bass voice. As I was humming that song this afternoon, taping my windows, getting them ready for paint, I realized something that's been heavy on my heart for many weeks and I'd like to share it with you. As believers in Christ, we are a family. In Hawaiian, the word is ohana, which means no one gets left behind. The idea is that family and friends are bound together and everyone work together to ensure that no one is forgotten. We are living in strange and unprecedented times. At the beginning of this pandemic, many of the followers of Christ banded together to reach out in love, not just to one another, but to our community as a whole. Remember the crazy toilet paper saga? Good times, good times. In the last few months, however, I've noticed many followers of Christ have become distracted by the craziness of the world that's around us. Masks or no masks? Trump, Trudeau, does COVID-19 really exist? Riots, defunding police, etc. 
I want to encourage you this week to not let the enemy take hold and distract you. We are to be lights in the dark, the calm in the storm, and beacons to those who are lost. This week, pray for our town, pray for our schools, pray for our government. Continue to pray for the first responders and for those that are working in retail. Most importantly, pray for one another, pray for our family. Let me leave you with this piece of scripture from Colossians 3, 13 to 17. Be tolerant with one another. Forgive one another whenever any of you has a complaint against someone else. You must forgive one another just as Christ has forgiven us. And to all these qualities, add love, which binds all things together in perfect unity. The peace that Christ gives us is to guide you in the decisions you make. For it is this peace that God has called you together in one body. And be thankful. Christ's message in all of its richness must live in your hearts. Teach and instruct one another with all wisdom. Sing psalms, hymns, and sacred songs. Sing to God with thanksgiving in your heart. Everything you do or say then should be done in the name of the Lord Jesus, as you give thanks through God the Father. Thank you for joining us. Have a wonderful week.